4, verse number 7. Let's all stand in honor of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. We're going to read one verse very quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. And then I'm going to pray and then you can be seated. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. I'm going to read this out loud. You can follow along there. The Bible says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity to get to be in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the message, Father, Lord, that you've given to me, the truth that, Lord, I believe that you've given to me to give to your people. I pray that you please would help me, Heavenly Father, Lord, to be a blessing where I can be a blessing, that, Holy Spirit, you know the work that needs to be done. Holy Spirit of God, I yield myself to you. I just ask you, Holy Spirit, that you please would help me to know exactly what you want said. Forgive me, Father, for I fail you. Forgive me, Father, for my faults. And thank you, Father, for using a, an earthen vessel. And God, you know the work that needs to be done in the hearts. And Holy Spirit, I beg that you please would do that work that only you can do. God, I can't do it. Lord God, I can't work in hearts. Holy Spirit, that's got, that, that's got to be you. I can give the word of God, but Holy Spirit, would you please work on the hearts of every individual in the room. If anybody's here, Lord Jesus, and they don't know that if they died, that they'd go to heaven. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would please speak to them and help them to be willing to get that settled before the evening's out. Lord, for all the Christians, may we be encouraged tonight. May we be exhorted in our faith. Lord, would you help me to do the work that you've given me to do as a pastor. I love you and thank you, Father, for everything that you've done. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can be here. I deserve to be in hell, but thank you for the blessing and the mercy that you've given to me. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, when I was down there in, in Longview this past week, for my because uh, we went down, we visited my, my in-laws and my grand, or Sarah's grandmother, my grandmother-in-law, uh, so to speak, and we got to go down there and see them. When I was there, though, uh, we traveled back uh, seven hours to Longview because my brother graduated from Bible college. He spent four years uh, at the same Bible college I graduated from uh, there in Longview, Texas, and uh, he got to graduate, turn the tassel, and I uh, couldn't believe they let him graduate. Now, I told him I said he deserved it, and he, did, he worked hard. And, uh, but he graduated this last week, and Dr., or Pastor Gray uh, preached from this chapter here uh, a message to them. And in preaching that, I was, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a man of God, you sit there and you hear another man of God preach, and then you're, sit, you're reading your Bible and you read through the verses that he uses, and God gives you a whole, a whole other sermon while you're at it. So you just write them down real quick. You know what I'm talking about, brother, amen. And, uh, or later, you know, you're not thinking about it right then, but then, you know, you're preparing messages, thinking about what the Lord would have you to preach, and God brings to your mind things that have already been turning in your head. And so this is one of those things, and how fitting it is when Brother Ken told me about this morning, uh, about how that the LGBT and all this movement are doing all this stuff. And I tell you, we're in a fight. Amen. As a Christian, when you got saved, you didn't realize it, but you entered a war. Boy, it's a mess out there. And we're in a fight. Look at what Paul says here in verse 7. He says, I have fought a good fight. Paul's getting ready to die. And he's talking to Timothy, his son in the faith. He tells Timothy, he says, you know, Timothy... I fought a good fight. See, this is why this was something that I like about Paul. In my opinion, Paul was one of the greatest New Testament characters that's ever been. He's one of the greatest New Testament examples of God's grace that you'll ever find. And God mercifully turned Paul around in his life, and we find Paul doing a great work for God. And I, like, I love Paul because I love his tenacity. Paul was a go-getter. You didn't outdo Paul because if you did, he was going to work harder. Paul was a man of zeal. Paul got after it in the ministry. Paul was a one that when you look, he didn't let hardship stop him. He didn't let, he didn't let the, the foe uh, discourage him from doing a work for God. Paul got after it. Boy, I love studying. If you get a time in maybe your Bible study, just study the life of Paul and where he went and how long and how, what he did and when he traveled his missionary journeys and the hardships that he faced. Boy, what a, what a man Paul was. Paul didn't just give in to anything. Paul says here, I fought. He didn't let the devil just have his way. Paul fought. 
He determined that when it came to what was right and what he knew the Bible said was true, he wasn't going to back down. Amen. And that's what I like about Paul. Boy, he, was, he just got after it. He was the first one in the fight, and he was the last one to leave. Amen. He thought, we're going to get this thing done. You know what we've lost in America? We've lost a fighting spirit. That's why America's a mess. Because we've lost this tenacity that Paul has. See, Paul says the Christian life, he says, I fought a good fight. See, all these Joel Olstein people, they think, well, we ought to just love everybody. And I agree we ought to love everybody. But that love does not mean that we're okay with, with wrong. Amen. I believe that we ought to love every sinner that walks into the house of God. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to let sin go unchecked. I mean, that I believe that we ought to love every person. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be okay with wickedness in America. And boy, in Wichita, Kansas, there may be a lot of churches that say, well, it's good to have this happen. And I say, hogwash. God says it's wickedness. And boy, you know why it's that way? You know why America, you know why Target's allowed to do that? Because nobody's willing to get up and fight for what's right. Nobody's willing to get in the battle and say and point a finger at somebody and say, you're wrong. God loves you. Jesus died for you, but you're wrong. No, but no Christians anymore will make the decision. They say, well, it's their decision, but you know what? I, still, I said they're going to do like that. I'm not going to shop there because I'm going to fight. You know why? Because I've got a little girl, and she's not going to have a country to, come, to, to enjoy freedom in because it's being stripped away from her day by day. The very people that plea for freedom are the very people taking away your rights. The very people that plea for freedom in America are the very people that are pushing gun control. You know why? Nobody fights anymore. Everybody says, well, we'll just let it go. Boy, I tell you what. I want to come to where Paul, at the end of the day, I can say, I fought. I don't want to come to the end of my Christian life and just say, well, I, I pleased everybody. If you're pleasing everybody, you're not doing something right. If you don't make somebody mad, you're not doing something right. Jesus made a lot of people mad. You know why? Because you're not going to obey this blessed old black book and somebody not get fighting mad. Well, I tell you, I get hot when I hear about stuff like this go on. I get mad when I hear that sin goes unpunished and unchecked because everybody says, well, let's just let it go. You know what? Sin doesn't need to be let go. I tell you, we need to get back to fighting. It's backwards in America. We used to, our country, we used to love right and hate wrong. Now we hate right and we love wrong. We love the wrong and we fight against the righteousness. You say, what are you talking about? How come in America a preacher can get up and it's, and it's happened? Pastors in this country have been put in jail recently put in jail for preaching the Word of God. Yet we'll let Kobe Bryant get away with his sin and sweep it under the rug. But we'll put a preacher in jail because he tries to save a little child from abortion. Because he tries to save a teenager from a life of drugs. Because he preaches against homosexuality. We'll put a preacher in jail because he preaches for righteousness. But we'll excuse Donald Trump. It's happened in America. You know why? Nobody fights for righteousness. America wasn't founded on that. Let me ask you a question, and this can be the title. Are you a fighter? Are you a fighter? In Christianity, Paul says, I fought. It's good to fight. Now, I'm not talking about getting into fisticuffs. Although I like a good boxing. Me and my brothers used to do it all the time. Who likes them sock and boppers? Man, I love them things. You remember those things, sock and boppers? You blow them up. Boy, we used those things. I loved them. That was the only excuse I had to hit my brother. <laughs> I get mad at him. Mm, you want to go put those on? <laughs> we loved them, amen. Now I couldn't do it against my sister. She just, I just had to stand there. But you know what? America's lost its fight. We've lost that. We were founded once a nation that fought for righteousness. We were founded as a nation that loved God. Now we push away the very God we fought freedom to worship for. You say, what are we talking about? Can I tell you a story? 
in eerie science, an eerie silence, excuse me, fell across the early morning darkness, and the young Baltimore attorney breathed a sigh of relief. It was after 1 a.m. on the morning of September 14, 1814, and it was the first time in more than 18 hours that things had been quiet. Since 7 a.m. the previous day, more than 1,800 bombs, cannonballs, and new Congreve rockets had lit the sky and shattered the peaceful harbor. From the deck of his sloop behind the enemy fleet, a young Baltimore attorney breathed a sigh of relief. Did you still see it there? He may have asked his friend, Dr. Beans. Dr. Beans knew what this man was referring to. Both men had strained their eyes through the darkness of night for the last several hours to glimpse the American flag that flew from Fort McHenry. During daylight, it was hard to miss. Even at this distance, the flag was 30 feet high and 40 feet wide. But as darkness had fallen, the only time the flag could be seen was during those seconds when it was momentarily lit by bombs the enemy hurled at the small fort. As long as the two men and, the th and their third companion, Colonel John Skinner, could see the flag flying, they knew there was still hope that their nation had survived. Now the bombardment had stopped and there was no flashes to light the sky and reveal that flag still waving proudly. Perhaps, in fact, that flag no longer waved. Maybe the reason for the silence was the unthinkable fact that Fort McHenry had fallen to the British, its defenders dead and Baltimore vulnerable to the same fate that had already befallen our, nationals, our nation's capital. Mingled with the uncertain fears about the fate of his fellow Americans, Mr. Key felt an even more frustrating sense of helplessness. His nation, just 38 years old, was on the brink of losing the freedom its patriots had fought and sacrificed for six years to achieve. And there was absolutely nothing he could do now to intervene or assist in its defense. He couldn't join the valiant warriors in defending the fort and resisting the invading British soldiers. He was himself a prisoner of the very same enemy that was raining molten death on his countrymen. The stillness dragged on for hours. Despite the fact that Mr. Key had not slept in close to 36 hours, the present quiet afforded no respite. With his companions, he strained his eyes toward the fort, willing them to pierce the darkness and find the red, white, and blue banner still waving proudly over Fort McHenry. He prayed for the rays of dawn to pierce the sky and reveal the sight that would signal the survival of his countrymen, perhaps indeed of his country itself. Slowly the, slowly the hours dragged on, then at 4 a.m. as daylight seemed near, the fusillade of deadly rockets began anew. In a sense, it was a welcome sound, for he knew that as long as the battle still raged, Americans still survived and resisted at Fort McHenry. The three-hour lull had simply afforded the British ground troops opportunity to position themselves for one final crushing assault. Now and then, a brief flicker of light from an exploding rocket would reveal what he thought might be that huge flag still flying proudly over the fort. Maybe he even caught himself anticipating, even hoping for another brilliant flash of light from the enemy rockets. Then he stopped himself, realizing that the same explosions that lit the skies to reveal the flag and allay his fears simultaneously rained death on the men who fought to keep that flag flying. So intense was the final bombard bombardment that the early morning dawn was filled with smoke and the odor of burnt gunpowder. So thick was the curtain of smoke that by 8 a.m. even the morning sunshine could not reveal whether or not the flag still waved. Then quiet returned. They watched as the British ships began to withdraw. Had the fort badly weakened by the enemy by na and naval bombardment finally fallen? Did it finally fall to the British ground troops? His sloop alone in the bay. He looked fearfully towards the shoreline. A breeze began to move across the water surface and the smoke of battle began to shift ever so slightly to reveal patches of blue sky. And then in the distant blue there appeared new colors, red and white. Brief glimpses of the two feet wide strips of the star-spangled banner. Then a star appeared in the daytime sky. Then another, then 15 stars in the daytime. And what a welcome sight they were. Mr. Key's heart swelled with hope and pride in the men who had so val valiantly fought through the night to keep that flag flying. Reaching into his pocket, he withdrew an envelope and began to write his thoughts. Oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. 
and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? See how sad in America, I told you that story because we used to fight. Because there was a nation that said, you can't do that. And they tried to oppress America. And they tried to say, you can't worship God in freedom. They tried to take that away from us. And forefathers fought and bled and died to keep a country that would be able to serve God in truth. But now our country is not dissolved from without, but from within. We're lost in America. Why? Because we're losing the battle to sin. We fought the world... We fought all those that would oppress. We fought the Hitlers and the Stalins and the British. We fought them all. And we've conquered. But we've lost the fight against sin. And you know where it started? The Bible says it started in our churches. It started in our churches. When churches lost that fighting spirit to not give in to the world, but to stand for righteousness, we lost it. We lost the battle. Sad that men and women have bled and died and given their lives for this country to preserve a land of the free and the home of the brave. Why? Not so that sin could run free, but that God could be worshipped in freedom. That's what we've lost in America. We've lost that fight. We've lost the love for our country. That causes us to fight and give it all that we've got to keep a nation strong and pure and clean and holy. Sad. Jude 1.3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Jude said, You know what? It's needful that I tell you, you ought to contend. You ought not to let the, the world run over you. You ought not to let the world just push you around and tell you that Jesus is dead or tell you that Jesus isn't God or the Son of God. He says you ought to contend for the faith. Now that's not talking about getting out there and beating somebody up, although sometimes you may feel like it, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting a backbone and standing for God and saying you're wrong. I'm not going to let you bring that into my home. I'm not going to let you bring that into my church. We need to contend. We need, to get, we need that fighting spirit. Are you a fighter? Do you fight? Do you fight for righteousness? Do you have a resolve that like Job, you, God can say that you eschew evil, but you love the right? How can we be a, a, like Paul? How can we be a fighter? Well, I believe in this portion of Scripture, we can learn just a few things about how to be a good fighter, and then we'll be done. Look there in verse number 5. It says, But watch thou in all things. Number one, you've got to watch. Jesus told the disciples, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Here it says, Watch thou in all things. If you're going to, do, if you're going to be a good fighter... If you're going to fight for righteousness, then you've got to watch. What do you got? Why do you got to watch? Because the devil's out there trying to tempt you. The Bible says the, fire, the devil's shooting those fiery darts of the wicked. And Jesus told the disciples to watch lest they enter into temptation. What's temptation? The devil's trying to bring sin in your home. The devil's out there trying to put those movies in your home, put that music in your home, put those TV stars in your home, all this junk. You know why? He wants you to succumb to temptation. So as men of God and women of God, we have to watch. We have to get up on our perches like they did in, on the ships, on the mast, and we've got to keep an eye out for the enemy trying to get in. See, that's what a pastor does for a church. A pastor is that man up there on the top of the mast watching for the enemy to say, watch out. The pastor gets up and says, look out. Here it comes. A dad has to be the same for his family. A dad has to be the one to get up on top of the, the mast of his home and look out for sin and watch when sin tries to creep in. Watch when the devil tries to keep in and he's got to fight for that family. Well, we've got to fight for our homes. 
We've got to fight for our families. You know why? The devil's trying to break up the home. The devil's trying to cause divorce. And the devil's bringing in the LGBT movement. You know why? The devil's trying to get, you, get us and destroy. Boy, we've got to fight. We've got to watch. You've got to get some eyes about you. You can't be like an ostrich and stick your head in the sand. So many Christians just cover our eyes. And we just say, well, if it comes, it comes. What happens, happens. God says, get some eyes about you and watch out. God says, look around you. Make sure, watch out for the devil and watch out for the wolf in sheep's clothing. No, he says, watch thou in all things. You can't let anything slip. You can't even let the little things. You've got to even take care of the little things. You've got to watch the little things. God says in everything you've got to watch out for. The devil's going to try to get in every way he can. You think I'm crazy? Well, let me take you back 60, 70 years ago when the devil wouldn't have dared had an LGBT movement, but he put Andy Griffith on the, on the TV. And Andy Griffith was a smoker. And he thought people would not have dared to have an LGBT movement. But we were okay with Andy Griffith because he had good moral values. It started there with the little things. It started with the John Wayne, like I said this morning. That he was a, a fighter, but he was a drunkard, alcoholic. Watching the kids, well, the kids watch on the screen while he stumbles around. Is that what you want your children to look like? Emulate? The devil knows he couldn't throw something really bad at you, so he throws the little things. That's what Disney is. Can I tell you something? That's what Disney is. Disney is not all out sin, they throw it behind the back. They come through the back door to come after your children. They try to make parents look stupid. And kids look like they're smarter than mom and dad. You know what that is? It's wrong. That's coming through the back door. But, but it's okay because we laugh. I'll give you one better. You know who played on Finding Nemo? You know who played, uh, what's that dumb fish, blue fish? Dory. Ellen DeGeneres. You know who Ellen DeGeneres is? A pervert. A homosexual. You know what the devil's trying to do? He's trying to get to your home the back way. We laugh, and I laughed, until you do some research. Then you find out, you know what the devil's trying to do? He's trying to come in little by little. And we wonder why. Why is America going down the drain? Because we as Christians, we haven't been watching. It's sad. We've got to watch in all things. Boy, God convicted my heart. I thought, whoops. I'm not the Christian I should be. I thought, God, I like finding Nebo. Anybody else with me in the boat? <laughs> I thought, God, I liked that. Then God says, yeah, but you got a daughter that's going to sit in that pew one day. What's worth more to me? I'd rather watch. Watch thou in all things. You're going to be a fighter? You're going to have to watch everything. You may get tired of it because you know what? Sin's everywhere. But you're going to have to watch everything. You're going to have to hide your eyes going down Walmart. You have to hide your eyes from the pool section. Oh, I hate going to Walmart. That's how I walk through Walmart. People think I'm crazy. But you know why? It's sin. It's everywhere. We have to watch. I've got to keep my mind clean and pure. Are you a fighter today? Number two. What else does it take to be a good fighter? It says, number one, watch thou in all things. Number two, endure afflictions. You realize that when you endure or when you are a fighter and when you get in this battle, that afflictions are going to come. 
that, trouble, that hard times are going to face you. The Christian life is not an easy life, but it's well worth it. It's a struggle. It's a battle. It's a fight. But it's the best fight you've ever been in. Afflictions are going to come your way. People are not going to understand. You're, not, you're going to be made fun of. Some are not going to agree with you. But you've got to decide what you believe and stick to it. Because it's worth fighting for. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12 says, says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I want you to notice the key there. You realize not every Christian will suffer persecution. Only those that will live godly. So pay attention. You may be saved, but that doesn't mean you'll be persecuted. It's when you step out by faith and you decide to live a godly life that the devil puts his sights on you. He says, all right, here we go. You can be like everybody else and just blend in with the crowd. There was a lot in the Bible days. Jesus, the Bible says that they believed on Christ, some of the Pharisees and the rulers, but for fear of the people, they didn't make it known. So they weren't persecuted. But there were a few that when they got saved, they separated. They stepped out and they said, you know what, we're going to be godly. When you make that decision in your life to step out by faith and live godly, mark it down, afflictions are going to come. But you know what? Any old dead fish can float downstream. But it takes a live one to go against the flow. It takes a live one. Boy, I like being alive. I like, have, I like having a backbone, amen. I like being in there and getting in a good fight, amen. Too many churches and Christians just fold because affliction comes. The Bible talks about when the sower sowed the seed, it fell on that ground and when it sprung up, because it didn't have a deep root, it just withered away. Many churches and Christians just fold when afflictions and hard times come. We just give in to pressure because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Brother, let me tell you, as a Christian, we've got to get to where we love God more than we like the favor of the world. It's going to take that. You know why? Because your children need a good church. Your children need a good nation. But it starts with us. Let me give you one more illustration. This is a book. I love this book. I took it in, I took it in college. It's called Baptist History. This is about... You see, before, long ago, there, was, there were two churches. You had the Baptist church, and you had the Catholic church. Can I read to you a story of what they did to a young girl? Her name is Blandina, in A.D. 177. She was a poor slave girl, 15 years of age. She was put to every torture that her Christian mistress might be implicated. She was kept in a loathsome dungeon and brought into the amphitheater every day to see the agonies of her companions as they were roasted in the iron chair or torn to pieces by lions. Her spirit was clothed with a superhuman endurance. For although racked from morning till night so that her tormentors were obliged to relieve each other for rest, her constancy vanquished her, their patience. Her only answer being, I am a Christian. No wickedness is done by us. Then they took her into the circus and suspended her on a cross within reach of the wild beasts to frighten her fellow confessors. The multitude howled for her life and a lion was let loose upon the poor child, but not a quiver passed over her frame. She looked into its mouth and smiled like a queen and the monster did not touch her. Only a century before this, the first slave girl was converted to Christ at Philippi, and now her ennobled sister cast holy defiance at the empire and serenely looked Europe in the face. Her calm soul told his great power that at, the last, that at last the weak were endowed with the omnipotence of the gospel. Her intrepid spirit showed for the first time how Jesus could lift a worm into the empire of a human conscience and could rebuke cruelty in the mute eloquence of love. The brightest page in the history of Rome was written that day in the beams of that child's hope. Taken down from the cross, she was removed to her dungeon, but finally brought back into the arena for execution. 
Her slender frame was a rare victim for the savage populace, and they gloated on her, but she flinched not. More than the angel in Gethsemane before the words and staves of the Passover mob, she stepped as lightly as if she were going to a banquet. She was first scourged, then scorched in the hot chair, and then at last, bef- and then at last cast before a furious bull, which tossed her madly. Even then a sharp blade was needful to take the lingering throb of life, and when her body was burnt to ashes, it was cast into the, into the Rhone. From that day, this harmless child slave has been with her redeeming master in paradise. From Thomas Armitage, History of the Baptist. You see, what we've lost in America is we're not fighting anymore. We don't realize that persecution is going to come one day, and somebody's going to pressure you, and somebody's going to make you have to say something about what you believe. There was a 15-year-old girl that stood before an amphitheater in Rome because all she did was get saved and get baptized. Now, many got saved, were never persecuted. But because she got baptized and she associated herself with Christ, they decided to persecute her. And that's just one story of many. One story of many men and women, children, boys and girls that died and fought to give us this blessed old black book and this wonderful church that we have today. And the world tries to make me think. The world comes to a pastor. I get emails. I get mail. They try to make me cower and they try to make me think that Well, why don't you just give in? I tell them, no, you know why? Too many people have fought and died. I'm not giving in for nothing. Too many people have given their lives for the doctrines that we hold dear. How dare I betray them and say, say, that's all right. We'll give in. We'll give in in this day and age. I won't do it. I'm a fighter. I want to preserve the doctrines that we've been given. You know why? Because somebody had to do it for me. I wouldn't be here, wouldn't have a church if there wasn't a slave girl that stood in an amphitheater and said, I won't bow, I won't recant. Boy, it's going to take somebody to look this government in the face and tell us, I'm sorry. But I love God. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to bow. All the other churches may bow. Every other denomination may bow. But boy, they met one young man that I got a little more of a backbone. I love God a little bit more than what they think. I love this Bible a little bit more than what they think. And I'm not going to cow down and cower. I'm going to stand up straight and say, I'm sorry. Too many people have fought and died. I won't give in. But you know, Christian, they're going to do it to you. They're going to do it at your workplace. They're going to do it where you work. They're going to do it where your children go to school. They're going to do it now, even in the public places, the public shopping. And you're going to have to decide if you really believe what you believe. You're going to have to decide if you really care, if you really love God. And it's going to cost. But nothing's greater than the cost of an old rugged cross that Jesus bled and died. I'd rather have a smile from God the Father and a frown from man than to, than to shake hands with a hypocrite and shake hands with a compromiser. Amen. And then have God look at me and say, you failed. Now I'll still get to be in heaven, but you realize that not everybody will get a well done. Not everybody will get a well done. It's to those that contend for the faith. Some are going to tell you, well, your standards are too strict. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to please God, not man. Boy, when you decide to live for God, the Bible is very clear. He says you shall suffer persecution. Buckle in. You got into a good fight. But you know, I love what Paul says. He says, I fought the fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And you know what? This is a good fight. It's worth being in. I'd rather fight for right than to fight for wrong. You're going to have to endure affliction. Number three. Look there in verse number five. You're going to have to do the work of an evangelist. 
What's the work of an evangelist? That's called soul winning. That's called soul winning. The hope for America is when we get out and we fight, but we fight on the streets. We fight, on the, we fight out here down by the church. We fight across town. We fight in the next town over on the streets, getting out there and giving out the gospel and telling people, Hey, there's a way you can be saved. Because that's the only hope for America. Paul said, I fought a good fight. But if you're going to be a good fighter, you have to be a good soul winner. How do you be like Paul? You win people to Jesus. How do you be like Jesus? You win people to Jesus. Amen. He won people to himself. He preached the gospel. That's what we're going to have to do. You're going to be a good fighter. You can, anybody can fight. Anybody can maybe stand up. Anybody can say, well, you know, we're, we don't believe that. But the true test is when you get out there, will you tell somebody about Jesus to give them a chance to have the same gospel you have? See, if we're going to be good fighters, we've got to be good soul winners. Do the work of an evangelist. Notice there, it's work. Soul winning's work. Boy, it's work. Get out there, it's hot. It's cold. But God says, do the work. Do the work. Get out there. Don't cow down. Be a fighter. Contend for the faith. Be a soul winner. Do the work. Work hard. Don't let, the, don't, let the, don't, don't let anything just stop you. Get in the way. It's a work, yes, but do it because it's necessary. Notice that's a command. Do the work. You know why? It's a necessary work. It has to be done. If people aren't told, if we don't do the work of an evangelist, people won't be saved. Lives won't be changed. That's the hope for America. The hope for America is our church is getting out, doing this work, and telling people about Jesus. We can fight the good fight all day long from the pew, but until we get out in the street, we'll never win anybody to Jesus. We've got to do the work of an evangelist. Last thing there, number four. Make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, don't quit. Make full proof. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't start out and then fall short. Don't let the devil get you so discouraged that you fall down and you don't get back up. You gotta get you gotta be determined that if you're gonna be a good fighter, you can't quit. You see, the object in the fight is not to be the one that hits the hardest. The object in a fight is not to be the one that has the stronger backbone, it's the one that can be there when the fight's done. The last man standing. You don't always have to be the hardest hitter. You don't have to be the greatest pastor. You don't have to be the greatest soul winner. You don't have to be the greatest Christian. But you can be faithful. God says a faithful man who can find. There's many that are talented, but they're not faithful. There's many that have, that have every chance of being great in the ministry, but they're not faithful. You just be faithful. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Don't stop short. Don't let the devil get you into a corner and then you back down. Be faithful. Don't let the devil get you to the point where you start skipping out on church and skipping out on God. You determine. You get it down. You mark her down in your mind and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. Amen. I'm going to be faithful to God. That's why, we have, that's why we have the problems in America because we'll start something but we won't finish. We will start this fight, but then when the pressure gets too tough, we'll stop. Boy, you're gonna, if you're going to be a good fighter, you're going to have to not quit. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to endure the affliction, and you're going to have to make your ministry foolproof. Foolproof. In other words, when you make something foolproof, it doesn't fail. This is foolproof. God's Word's foolproof. You know why? It doesn't fail. That means you're going to have to get God's Word involved. That means you're going to have to get God involved. Make full proof, full proof of thy ministry. Don't quit. Don't quit. I don't know how many times go out and cut, quit out of the dictionary. I did that. I remember as a teenager, a preacher got up and said, you ought to cut the word quit out of your dictionary. So I did. I went home. I found my dictionary. Of course, Dad, was, of course, Dad beat me to it. <laughs> I went and I got the dictionary Dad had and he had already cut it out. And I was like, oh, man. Some of you ought to go home and cut the word quit out of your dictionary. You ought to even not even know what it means. Don't quit. Be faithful. If our church is going to be a lighthouse, we're going to have to be a lighthouse that stays lit. 
You see, the, the devil's trying to blow that light out. But we've got to determine that we're not going to let the world, the flesh, and the devil have their way. We're going to fight. Are you a fighter? Boy, if not, get a fighting spirit about you. Get an attitude that you're not going to let the devil come and push you down. And if you do fall down, get back up. Get back up. Look old smutty face in the eye and you tell him, say, buddy, you're going to hell anyway. Yep. Amen. That's what I do, boy. It gets a little bit tough. The devil gets me down. The devil gets me to where he discourages and thinks, oh, hey, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Just, just go home. Just stop serving God. And I look at him and say, buddy, you may have won this battle, but you're going to lose the war one day. God's given us the victory, amen. The devil's going to spend eternity in hell, amen. The devil's going to be kicked, old smutty face going to be kicked right into the lake of fire, going to be bound for a thousand years, and I'm going to be one that's going to kick him, amen. I want to be the one. I tell God, I'm going to give him a good old shove. But you can't quit. Boy, you got to determine that this is, this is more than just, this, this, this church is more than just a place. This church is more than just a building Amen. with grass that grows like crazy. <laughs> You've got to determine that this is a, a precious place that's been fought and paid for by many before you. Yeah. You've come into a place that you didn't realize the, a high price has been paid. A high price. Lives of men and women. And now you get to be a part of it. What are we going to do, dear Christian? Are we just going to let everything that these men and women in our Baptist history that they fought for, are we just going to let it go down the drain? Just because we don't like what it says? Well, you might, but I'm not. If you decide to do that, God bless you. Here's one good, good old-fashioned preacher that says there's too much at stake for that Blessed old black book. There's too much that I know and believe. After four years of Bible college, I don't claim to know everything, but boy, you know what they taught us? They did teach us that there's a high price been paid. And they told us, they said, buddy, when you become a pastor of a Baptist church, you've taken more on than just a church. You've taken on a place that's been carried down and, and, and handed from generation to generation. Every doctrine that I've preached to you, all the basics we went over on Wednesday night, those are all doctrines. All of those were handed down from generation to generation to generation. So, I'm not going to just say, well, because it feels good. We've got to determine that we love God. We've got to determine that it's worth fighting for, for your children. Boy, some of you have some precious children. I want them to have a good church. Yeah. I'm tired of this neo-evangelical philosophy yeah, yeah. where we bring up a rock concert, make our children feel good, look like Justin Bieber. Bunch of nonsense. I want somebody to look like an old-fashioned independent Baptist yeah. that loves God. Amen. No more of this. I saw we got a thing in the mail. We want to come to your church. Some Christian rock. That's what they look like. Okay. You think I'm crazy. It's what they look like. I, I looked at them the same way. We want to come to your church. We want to sing for you. I thought over my dead body. You know why? Somebody didn't fight. Some little punk 20-year-old thinks he's going to come to my church and tell me what the Bible really says. Hogwash. I'm going to fight for something. Now the question is, are you going to fight for something? 
because a pastor can't do it alone. We've got a band together just like they did. There's a picture on the front of this. All these people here cast into the middle of the amphitheater as a church. Whole churches were brought and just put right in the middle. And all the wild beasts were allowed to have their way in front of hundreds and thousands in Rome. Some of them were put on the mantle sticks and used as torches to light the, to light the amphitheater. My friend, there's a high price been paid. Let's not quit. Let's be a fighter. Are you a fighter today? If not, you need to make a commitment to God at this old-fashioned altar and say, God, I'm going to fight for something. I may die doing it. But the, best, but the worst day I have in God's will is better than any day I have outside of God's will. The worst day of persecution in a dungeon I may face as a pastor because they're putting pastors in jail. I may not be here next Sunday. You'll have to come to the prison. We'll sing. I may not be here, but that the worst day I have in the will of God is better than any day standing up here and compromising. Too much at stake, amen. Let's make a decision to fight for something. Boy, you ought to fight. You ought to be willing to fight. Now, I'm not saying it like, again, you got to run and jump on somebody and hit something. You know, don't, don't hit poles outside the church or nothing. <laughs> but you ought to fight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, love you. Lord God, thank you for the service. Lord, I pray that it was a blessing. Holy Spirit, May you please have used the message. I pray that, Heavenly Father, that we would take the truth of God's Word and we would have learned from it. Thank you, Father, for your people, Lord, their patience, their love for you. Lord, I pray that now as we have a time of invitation, that, Lord, we would come forward to an altar and decide to be a fighter to decide that no matter what this world does, that no matter what this country does, to no, no matter what this city does, that we're going to uphold and do what's right and not give in. Lord God, we need you in a great and a mighty way. Heads bowed, nice closed, very quickly.